Welcome to Desert Island Slabs. This is a new hobby podcast where we take a collector each week or each month and we focus on them. They choose eight objects within their collection that mean something to them and where they sit in the overall context of their life. My first guest is Favard Iqbal, otherwise known as Tickets and Slabs on Instagram and also Discord. He is a father of two living in the south of England with his wife and he has been collecting for some years now. He formally started um, a role at PSA as a ticket authentication consultant in early January 2023 and I'm honoured to have him on as my first guest as, as he has become quite a good friend over the last few years. So hello Fav. Hi, James. I'm, I'm honoured too, I might add, because uh, we've been talking about this for a while and uh, to kind of be the first guest is is uh, a bit of an honour. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, when I sort of thought I wanted to do Desert Island Slabs, I basically knew that you were going to be the first guest, regardless <laughs> of whether you agreed to it or not. So I was... Uh, glad that you did um so yeah i'm sure more things about your life will come out and, and things over the course of the chat but what do you want to talk about first um so i guess you know i've uh, I, i've you know we, i was posited the idea of picking i suppose eight slabs um for this kind of like mythical idea what, what would i take to a desert island with me um and i've kind of gone through bits of my collection and these items really like to me they 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 strike a chord and they're not necessarily i don't think what people would 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 kind of expect i think you know i've got i've got a lot of items that are probably more valuable um and i've got a lot of items that are probably more culturally important than the ones that i've selected um but the ones that i think we'll talk through today kind of resonate with me in, in, in certain ways that kind of make them um, totally irreplaceable and, you know, take me in, in, in a lot of these instances to perhaps different parts of my life where, um, you know, they, they, they evoke something that's abstract. Um, and for me, that's kind of important when you're sort of collecting um, it, it, it's sort of, a, a large part of the reason why I have collected these items. Um, and I think the best way of doing it is probably to go through them chronologically from, from the sort of, uh, you know, the oldest item through to the latest. Um, and some of them are quite recent, you know, they're, they're relatively modern items. Um, so I've got eight in particular. Um so shall I shall I get on and introduce yeah, the first it's, one? Yeah, it is an eclectic, it's an eccentric <laughs> list, and um, yeah, like you say, I, I guess when you're tasked with something like this, it becomes quite difficult because the temptation is to maybe go for the more obvious items in a way. But then when you do a bit of deep dive, almost introspective analysis, then you actually realise, wait, this actually has more of an impact on me than this objectively yeah. wow item. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to chatting through some of these, to be honest. So I guess having talked up how abstract some of these, <laughs> these items are, the first one, actually, it probably probably isn't as abstract as a lot of the others, no. um, yeah. you know. So um, this is this is my first pick. So this is this is kind of um, uh, Olympics 1968 ticket um, from the session in which the Black Power salute took place. Um, and yeah, I mean, the story behind it is that I've kind of had it for the best part of two or three years now. Um, uh, the way that I picked it up at the time was um, th there'd been a couple that had been graded, but um, it was quite it's quite difficult to kind of work out um, whether I had the right session at the time. Mm -hmm. And so kind of started with doing a load of research because that sort of stuff wasn't really in the public domain. And what, what I'm kind of like referring to there is that there's, there's kind of two clocks here and 
uh, one is sort of I think 10 a.m. and the other one's 3 p.m. So instantly, when you look at this, um, you, you would initially think, okay, well that's a that's a ticket for 10 a.m. through to 3 p.m. That's a morning session. And if you do your research, you can find out that actually the Black Power salute would have taken place on the evening. Um, and so for a good while, I was kind of searching for a ticket that that had a 3 p.m. start date or start time and a kind of you know 10 p.m. finish. And I just kept drawing a blank. I couldn't work out why I couldn't find this ticket. And yeah. it was only when, you know, you started to compare it to some of the other sessions at that games, you realized that um, they're not start and end times, that they're, they're just start times. Um, so on this particular date, on the 16th of October, you had a ticket that allowed you entry to kind of both sessions. Um and those seem to be the only ones available for October the 16th. Um, and so kind of the way that I, I, I got that particular ticket was, you know, I, I, I sort of just found a Mexican sort of seller of Olympic tickets. And I think um, I just asked him, did, did he on the off chance have this ticket? And he did. He was very frank about what it, what it, what it stood for. It was the day of the Black Power Salute. And I kind of, you know, said, that's exactly why I want it. And we agreed a price that was, you know, it was less than a hundred dollars at the time. Um, and, you know, it's been in my collection ever since. Um, but what I kind of love about it is several fold really. So firstly, it's an incredible looking ticket, isn't it? Yeah, it's incredible uh, looking. It, it is. It's, you know, just, I mean, if you just look at it, like, like I think that the kind of contrast of the blue and yellow, is just sort of, it's like a really striking combination. Yeah, really, really. So striking. You do have kind of other variants of this. So where the, where the band in the middle is kind of a different color, and um, that's largely because they will have represented a different price point. Um, but yeah, ty- typographically, um, you know, the Mexico games were um, iconic in the sense that sort of um, you know this lettering was kind of widely readapted for. Uh, the 1970 World Cup, which also took place in Mexico. Yeah. Um, so there's that. I mean, it's just a visually stunning ticket. Um, and, you know, there, there, there are a few moments that kind of when you um, when you talk about them with people, they kind of like they get it. They suddenly get why you collect tickets. And this is one of them. Um, because it, you know, the, the Black Power salute itself, it's, it, it's something that transcends sport. It's not just a, um, a thing that happened at a game. I mean, it is that, but at the same time, it, it, it's a symbol of defiance. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I think people know from the image. Um, even if they might not be able to place why it took place, they'll be familiar with the image itself. Um, and so, yeah, I, I suppose this ticket for me, it, I mean, it's the pinnacle of my collection. Um, it probably represents one of the early tickets that I picked up that wasn't soccer related. Uh, sort of consider myself to be like a soccer aficionado first and foremost. Uh, but then kind of eventually was sort of thinking about other sports and um, the the Olympics is kind of something that I feel like I knew quite well. Um, and this was probably one of the first Olympic tickets that I, I, um, I sought and then found. Um, so it's a real kind of, for me, it's, it's a big sort of cradle to grave piece. It's, uh, something that I managed to source something that, you know, I then went and, um, you know, graded. I'm still kind of slightly upset about the grade on this one. So yeah, it's, it's a one. It's a one point five, isn't it? Is that yeah? It's one point five. So I think that's because kind of it's got it's got a few staple holes on on kind of right. white slip, um, and it does also have a bit of a light light sort of fold along there, um, and that's kind of it, it's a slight sort of marring on the. On, in, in the grand scheme of things, you know, that it's only been ordered 1.5. But, I mean, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just one of those things that... But uh, I, I, every now and again, I float with the idea of, like, getting it regraded. Um, mm. But to be honest, it's not 
it's not something that I'm ever going to sell. So actually it's more for aesthetic kind of, you know, the idea of having fair 1.5 actually to me kind of mars it slightly. And that's why I'd rather have it sort of just saying authentic or, or, you know, yeah, just a reappraisal of kind of the, the grade. Um, overall, it's not something that I'm massively bothered by. Um, although I'm kind of making it sound like I am. You sound, yeah. <laughs> you sound like you are, to be honest. Or yeah. So some sort of, chat after about that <laughs> yeah. so that's item number one that's item number one and i feel like i've laid the point on, on on that one but um shall we move on to the next one yeah because you're you're I mean, we we've started with athletics and we're continuing with an athletic type theme Is yeah so the next choice yeah so this is this is a bit of a kind of interesting one because i mean you know the the mainstay of my collection is tickets. Um, and then the second mainstay is probably, you know, cards. And then after that, it's random stuff. And this probably kind of falls within the random stuff yeah. sort of category. So this is um, uh, track and field on Absolute the Game Boy, which is... banger of a game. <laughs> um, okay. And I think, I think the, you know, when I was kind of trying to pick out, well, why, why have I selected this game firstly? Um, I grew up in in kind of a bit of a sort of uh, pro- probably a similar family to you, James. You know, I mean, it was an Asian upbringing. My parents were both sort of first gener- generation immigrants to the the UK, um, and both quite, I would say, disapproving when it came to consoles and things like that. Um, you know, there was a, a, if a, you know there were a bad influence. That was the idea. It was a bad influence to play computer games. They were distracting me from kind of the things that I should have been doing, which was being good at school and being good at maths and mm. you know working hard on your studies. They were a distraction. They were a bad influence. Um, and you know, I think in in a way, in adult life, I think that's probably exacerbated kind of quite how addicted I've become to video games oh, really? in general. Yeah, I think I think you know. <laughs> Um, it's it, it's one of those where I think I just play computer games all the time as a result of kind of having this sort of um, almost uh, uh, preclusion, I suppose, from 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 sort of playing them. Uh, How did that work then? In terms of you were you were rest- as in not allowed to for a bit, or or what? What? Happened? Yeah. I think- so I mean, you know, eventually I'd kind of wore my mum down. I remember. I think I think my dad was always slightly disapproving. Like, so we didn't have a desktop computer until kind of quite deep into um, when I had just joined secondary school, which comparatively probably doesn't sound that late on. But compared to a lot of my contemporaries at primary school, they mm-hmm. they kind of had the desktop computer, and that was a tool as much as kind of you know something to. Um, you know play games on um whereas for me i think i just wore my mum down I, I kind of really wanted a game boy and eventually i think in i think the winter of it must have been 1997 i um i, I got one for my birthday it was a game boy wow. pocket um and you know it was just a really kind of it, it was like a smaller version of the game boy yeah, um I remember it. And it came with a couple of like preloaded kind of things because I think my mum was like, "If I'm getting you a Game Boy, I'm not going to get you a bunch of games to go with it." Like, kind of, you know, this is this is a lot of money. This is a special present, so it kind of had these like crap arcade games like Joust and Asteroids or something on it. Things that were Ill- ill-designed, really, for the for the Game Boy. And I just loved playing it. I remember kind of, you know, some of the games that I got for it were were, were from friends, so um you know school school friends sort of lent me um paperboy which um still absolutely kills me that game oh, yeah, um it's a good game then, it's a good game. then there was worms which was kind of you know yeah. m- much well much more known on 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 kind of pc but there was a game boy iteration of it and then kind of the week that i passed my 12 plus and it was a 12 plus in buckinghamshire it kind of you know had this selective grammar school type system you passed it, you went to a grammar school, you failed it, you'd go to a local comprehensive. And I guess I was fortunate to pass it, I guess, or, you know, lucky. Um, but as a reward... Was it? 
all the verbal reasoning <laughs> it probably, tutoring it probably was actually, drummed, yeah. I think, drummed I think, into you. <laughs> it was like, this is how you do a verbal reasoning type <laughs> there, you know? we've all We've all been there in the South awful, of England, I awful. swear. But, you know, so my parents were kind of like, well, in fact, I mean, my dad was still quite draconian at this time, but my mum was sort of a lot more, yeah, you deserve a reward for having passed your 12 plus. Um, why don't you get a Game Boy game? And I went to Dixon's and there was this copy of kind of track and field. And I, I, I bought it and I just would play it like nonstop. And I think at the time, I didn't realize that you were meant to press A and B, the buttons kind of alternately. So it was just like pressing them all. I was like, why, why isn't this guy going quicker? Yeah. Why am I not breaking the world record? And it was only years later that I realized that you were meant to kind of press them alternately. And I, I kind of, I have to be honest with you, I didn't really think about the graded game at all for a number of, uh, well, e- even when the surge of excitement in graded games kind of came um, a couple of years ago, it wasn't something that I was particularly interested in. Um, but when I went out to sort of um, California last year to visit the PSA offices, um, I, I, I was kind of lucky enough to sort of do a tour of kind of everything on site and, you know, they do, they do everything on site. So it's kind of coin grading, game grading, everything. And I just saw like this track and field kind of Game Boy game on someone's sort of almost like mantelpiece. I just thought it was the coolest thing I'd seen in years. And it just like, honestly, it just took me back to kind of, yeah. you know, being, being a child and playing it on my Game Boy. And I was like, I've got to have that. Um, and so I found a seller who had it on eBay for about, I think, I think, I think it was about a grand or something like that. And I was like, this is way too much money, but I'll reach out to him. And he got back to me probably about a month after, because I don't think he'd seen that I'd I'd sent him a message. Mm. And I said, well, look, I'd really love it, but I think it's a bit out of my price range, but I just wanted to say it's an amazing piece. And, you know, then kind of said, well, you know, how, how much would it cost? What is the best that you could do on it? And he, he turned around and said $350. And I was like, right, sold, like, you know, instantly. I was like, that is not as much as I thought it would be. Um, I want it. I think it's, you know, visually, it's just like everything about this. Kind of, you know, but I, I mean, for me, it's just the Game Boy symbol almost, you know, the side. Right. It's, it, it's just like such a um, primal kind of, uh nostal- nostalgic memory for me this is and um it's you got know. like a rubik's cube sort of vibe to it on the front yeah it's, it's yeah so, nice yeah so funnily enough i mean over over the the christmas break i i kind of bought myself and i don't know if you, you you've kind of come across one of these but these are sort of yes. like these are called analog pockets which are sort of you know emulator style kind of um things for um uh the game boy um and a bunch of other things but uh, you know and i'm not doing this just as a prop but I, I literally have been i've been playing this like non-stop like recently you know so <laughs> it's just like it's just you know for me it, it just evokes so much of that um kind of childhood and you know the bad influence thing and you know just just loving playing it all the time um yeah. it's it's not the most famous game boy game it's not um you know a game that's necessarily uh it was the first like the first platform that it was on it's just for me it just you know hits that spot that's what i want from a collectible that's why i wanted it um and yeah no exactly it's it's not that this isn't going to be about retreading my sports compendium videos but in the middlesbrough video i mentioned about the proustian effect that that scene in ratatouille where for instance you know the critic tries ratatouille which is quite a mundane dish in some ways but he is transported Anthony goes transported back to that rural province in France and his mum's home cooking and what was a peasant's dish yeah, it's, it's yeah. incredible when you see something and it's the same with yeah. me in the foil stickers um to be honest with you when I see them you sort of you know the tearing and then you see that little like prismatic effect or something and it just it really yeah. it, it's incredible and um yeah I didn't I didn't really have that so much with uh video games but I think the best proxy would be a dog. As yeah. in, I basically had the exact feelings you yeah. had, but it was with a, it was with a, it was with a, it was with a dog. Um, so I was granted a dog when anyway, I was fourteen. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. But we'll 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 continue on, and and we're going to go again. Athletics. 
Yeah, but so go a little bit further this, on. D- yeah, so so um, it, it, I, I suppose it came to light years later that we were at the same sort of event that has kind of triggered this to kind of be picked. But um, we'll we'll come on to that in a bit. But you know. As as I suppose I've kind of already alluded to with 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 the two picks, athletics and and kind of the Olympics for me were have have sort of become two things I suppose that that I, you know a lot of my collection is based around now, um, and I suppose for me a big part of that uh, interest stems from being in London during the twenty twelve. Olympics um I remember kind of you know the the well I say I remember it I mean in 2005 when we were bidding for it I I didn't even know we were bidding for it it was a bit of a surprise to me yeah and then kind of you know there was the shock announcement that we'd we'd be hosting the games in 2012 um kind of you know there's these scenes in in um Trafalgar Square, where you have like the sports minister, was it Tessa Jowell at the time, yeah. um, kind of celebrating with Tessa, you know, yeah. Ken Livingston and all of these other people being like, kind of, yeah, we've won the Olympics. It's like, and at the time, I just thought to myself, okay, well, I'm kind of in between my first and second year at, at university, but a longer term hope for me is, yeah, I'd love to be living in London when when the Olympics kind of goes on. And we all kind of know, sort of the following day, that, you know, you, you had this kind of, period of um almost um going from uh this this sort of feeling of amazement we've won the olympics through to kind of you know what happened the following day which is kind of like the seven seven bombings and um everyone just kind of shell-shocked that this was sort of taking place in in london um yeah and and i suppose for me there was that period of kind of uh, it was it was the summer between my first and second year at university and um I, i'd gone i'd gone to kind of you know a university in the north of england uh, durham and i remember there being quite a lot of like anti terrorist sort of sentiment and you know actually that was becoming more like anti islamic kind of mm. Um, and although I don't kind of consider myself to be particularly religious, you know, that was particularly hard when, you know, you live in a family full of people that, that sort of, you know, do identify as Muslims and kind of, you know, actually it probably just began and continued to perpetuate that feeling of anti sort of Asianness, I guess, that, that kind of sometimes comes about with, with an event like that. And, I I don't know. I found I found the whole kind of thing pretty pretty difficult at the time. It was it, you know I remember when I was in kind of a student at, at sort of Durham. I, I think it was still kind of beginning to form my sort of ideas as a as a, as an adult. I think I think up until yeah. that age, I'd yeah. still probably felt like a child. Didn't really realize what was going on. Um. And and I suppose that's the funny thing about sport, really. It's kind of you know you don't you don't really need to be political to kind of get it or enjoy it. Um, certainly, with a, 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 and you know I'm beginning to kind of wonder where I'm going with all of this, but but kind of come come sort of 2008, I was you know lucky enough to kind of be a student in London, and uh, I was working in a lab. Um, uh doing kind of organic chemistry uh it's weird because people are like oh you're not a chemist anymore and i'm not um and you know at the time it was kind of like it wasn't something that i wanted to be doing forever but um yeah it actually meant oh a lot of my friends are moving down to london i get to move to london as well and it's a convenient way of being able to continue that journey um and i suppose so i had funding for three years and uh that lapsed in september of 2011 and that was really annoying timing because that was the summer before the olympics itself and um you know uh, uh, like the tickets weren't weren't exactly cheap you know the cheapest no. level tickets were kind of what 150 quid for some of these medal sessions and you know they they went up really quickly to kind of being 
you know, 750, what was it, 2012, I think, was the most expensive level of ticket. And I kind of applied in the ballot and didn't get anywhere. Um, and I uh, just kind of wrote it off and thought, okay, well, this is this is a shame. I'd really like to attend this particular session because I know um, Usain Bolt will probably be running in the 200 metres and it's the triple jump final. So Philip Sido will be there. And I think it was the culmination of the decathlon, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and I thought that looks like a really cool day to go. Um, I hadn't really thought at the time about, about any of the other events. And um, eventually kind of, you know, um, I'd, I'd sort of written up my kind of doctorate early in that summer and, you know, had had the rest of the summer off. And it was amazing because, you know, the summer of 2012 was basically probably the best time to kind of, uh, uh, for, for, from a sport enthusiast time to kind of be off, you know, you got all of the Olympics, but before that you had Man, Man City winning the league, unfortunately, James, uh, in, in, in very dramatic circumstances. Uh, you had Chelsea winning the Champions League, um, you know, in this kind of um, almost, I mean, you know, how, how they managed to win that, that, yeah. that Champions League with kind of, you know, the, the games against Barcelona and then Bayern Munich. I think we were in ULU um, together, weren't we? We said we were in the ULU. Union. We were, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, you know, there. I mean, you know, I was uh, I was a student at UCL, um, you know, stones throw from ULU, um, and ULU, you know, the University of London Union was was a fantastic yeah. venue for watching football because you had probably students from all sorts of backgrounds. So, you know, when when Barcelona scored, it would be a lot of Spanish people would be cheering for, for, for Barcelona, you know, rather than just kind of, oh, everyone in London must support Chelsea. Yeah, um, great, yeah, great Chelsea champions. I mean, a hilarious one was Iniesta's late goal. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That, was, that, was a, that was a brilliant one. I was in, I was in a pub in, uh, I think, what was it, Finsbury Park, <laughs> when, when, when watching that game, and it turns out that, you know, that that was a bad decision. I think you know the Arsenal fans just went absolutely crazy, um, which was basically the entire club. Um, yeah, it was. It, look, I mean, it was just a brilliant summer to kind of have off from the perspective of sport. You had like the Tour de France, which kind of you know caught everyone's imagination with Froome and, and Wiggins kind of you know fighting it out. Um, no comment. No comment. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Olympics rolled around and I kind of, the, the best that I was able to muster was a ticket for the beach volleyball, which was lended to me by a friend. Um, and at this point, I was pretty much penniless because I'd kind of been 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 living at home for the best part of the year. Um, and I was just kind of idling before beginning my kind of graduate job in September of that year. Um, so it's pretty penniless, still living at home, aged kind of 26, wanting to be a part of the action that I thought I would be a part of in 2005, but not really experiencing it in the, in the way that I wanted to. Um, and then kind of, you know, I was beginning to hear on Twitter, which was quite early on back in, I suppose, 2012, that tickets were sort of continuing to be released. And I... A, a lot of people were relying on a trigger kind of type um, system, like a plug-in on, on kind of Chrome or Mozilla Firefox or whatever it was that was in fashion back then. Um, but I created my own. I was like, you know, I was so bored that I didn't want to wait for the kind of one minute trigger that you'd get on on this particular plugin. So I kind of engineered my own. Wow. And it was still this session that I wanted, you know, the one with the 200 meters, Philips Adobe. And exactly a week before the event, the trigger went and I borrowed my sister's credit card uh, and she basically paid for me to go to the Olympics, you know, a £150 level ticket. And I have to say, I think I, th I still think it's the best £150 I've ever spent. Um, and well, I say I've ever spent, so my sister's ever spent on my behalf. She did get paid back, but, um, you know... Um, it, uh, you know, you, you have these pre-expectations of what's what's going to be the thing that takes your breath away. And actually, it wasn't any of the events that we planned to see. It was the men's 800-metre uh, final, which is, you know, years later, continues to be called by, I think, commentators, 
the greatest 800 meter race of all time because what happened is that every athlete posted a national record a personal best and even the person that placed last would have won gold it every one of the last three olympics i think before that which is just incredible um and as it turns out years later i found out that you were there on the same night i was um <laughs> and yeah so for for me i think i think this third choice is basically a card from quite a well known set and not a particularly it's a base card um but it was one that i had three copies of one looked a bit crap i graded the other two one came back a 10 and that's this card here um so this is david radisha um he's still world record holder for the 800 meters he ran what's considered to be um you know the greatest 800 meter race of all time and we both happened to be at the stadium um and for me it's just he it's the single greatest thing that I think I've ever seen, you know, seeing a world record set at the Olympics when you're in the stadium, but also kind of, you know, he was almost someone that I hadn't heard of before I went, went, went to the games. It, it, it was just absolutely stunning. You go there thinking you're there for Bolt versus Blake. And it turns out that you're there for something else. You've witnessed history, but it's totally, totally different to what you thought you were, you were there for. Um, so yeah, double Olympic champion. Actually, thinking about it, so he retained it in 2016. Um, yeah. And it's it's interesting. I mean, I mean, adrenaline, London. I mean, people. If we're saying this is a hobby podcast, people talk about unique individual sets in the hobby. Um, yeah. But adrenaline, London is. I mean, we don't talk about value really on on this, but it's just an incredible set. I, I love that set as well, yeah. and I don't think we'd ever spoken about it. But it's it's such a unique set. Yeah, I think it's it the the you you tend not to I think since then. Well, so I suppose you've got you've got two things. You've got you've got the fact that it's a home Olympics, and for me, that's you know it's it's a huge kind of thing that um, there's kind of i guess able to experience all of that and all of the buzz around it and you know um, whether it was kind of the cycling or the tennis or whatever then you've got this kind of like multi-sport set that has so many of the people that became household names during those two weeks kind of within it and you know a lot of these people are just ordinary people um exactly. you know they're, they're not they're not kind of you know they're probably working in businesses or or whatever now um, this might well be one of their only cards. In the case of David Rudisha, the only other card or the only other thing that I'm aware of is the sticker from the corresponding set. Yeah, which is also a cool, cool album as well. It's a cool album. Honest, so I quite like that as well. And I kind of find that like absolutely mind bending in a way that kind of, you know, this is a this is a world record holder. This is a person who, you know, ran one of the greatest races of all time. Um and the best card that you can go out there and find of his is still a base card in a, you know, I mean, it's not a tops Chrome type set. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a pretty basic set. I mean, it's probably one peg above a match attacks. Um, you know, how I managed to get a PSA 10 on it, God knows, but you know, the, yeah, the gem rate on, on, on this particular set is incredibly low. Um, but yeah. The base, um, yeah, the base ones are very hard to gem. Um, on adrenaline 2012 and uh yeah i mean it's it's also got anthony joshua's rookie anthony cards. joshua um, um who else laura is in trott, there? laura trott uh, i'm thinking of base wise laura trott there's a there's a beckham base there's a gareth bale base there's a kobe bryant base um, yeah and then in the glitter you say bolt as well yeah, you know yeah bolt's got one of the glitter foils which is it's a it's a great looking card i'll, I'll probably i'll pull it up uh, after um, I meant to get, I'm not going to ruin the flow by getting the binder. <laughs> and, uh, Alexander Rusik's rookie card, um, Michael Phelps, Nadal. It's just, it's such a yeah, it's, set. It's, it's an incredible set. And I, you know, whenever I go to one of these sort of card shows, it's almost the set that I'm looking for and no one ever has it. I think, you know, the print, the print runs probably kind of out of this world. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, it wasn't a low printed run type thing, but 
the the foils and the kind of because there's like super foils and glitter foils yeah. which which this card isn't one of you know this is simply a base card there's probably you know 10 lying on ebay if you look at it but the super super foils and the glitter foils in my experience seem to be a lot lot harder to find and you know um yeah, it's, it, it's a few. fantastic set. It yeah. is, it's always interesting with these ones because you don't know if they're just not there because I think there's a there's quite a famous Russian gymnast called Kanieva as well. That's uh-huh. also a quite significant card for her. Um, but then the super foils tend to be British elite stars, yeah. and those are re- they, those appear really infrequently. Um, people like Nathan Nathan Robertson, Andy Murray has one. Um, yeah. And yeah, they I love that. I, they, they they're quite thin, aren't they? They're quite like thin yeah. Cards. I mean. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it, then they're not they're not kind of you know intended to be kind of sent to PSA and graded. You know, they're no. they're, they're they're playground sort of cards. Um, it's it, yeah, I mean, it's it it's crazy for me. You know, someone as distinguished actually as David Rudish doesn't even have like a to my knowledge and you know a Sports Illustrated for Kids type card either. Um, you know that that's usually the other outlet or top trumps or anything like that. I mean, there seems to be nothing out there. Yeah. The only option you've got is is actually something that is a proper card, which is quite nice. Um, yeah, um, it, there's so many reasons that kind of I can go to that are about the athlete with this particular object. But the thing is, it, it's one of those that takes me back to 2012. I was yeah. there in the stadium. We saw that happen. It was incredible. Uh, this is this is an athlete that I followed ever since it you know it's it's just a personal personal choice for me i would take it to a desert island <laughs> you know yeah. i'm not and, selling um, it under any circumstances that's the uh that's the crux of it the, the radisha pump begins now <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly well i'll tell you, I'll tell you what one, one of the things that i am looking for actually is 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 a ticket from that session and it's actually relatively difficult to get because so many people want it for the bolt sort of set that they've mm got on the set registry so it's it's quite a difficult ticket to find in unused condition but i'd love to like i mean you know for me it, i mean that's a dream you know get the ticket signed by someone like rudisha i don't even know how you go about doing that because you know, you're talking about an athlete that resides in kenya so i don't think it's going to be easy to you know ttm it yeah and then so we're, so we're, we're moving then. So Radisha, who is a world record holder, he is, I wouldn't describe him as under the radar, but compared <laughs> to the focus or the, 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 the star player of the next item. Yeah. Who's not really under the radar. No, he's not. So. He's not. Um, and so the, the next item is uh, this. It's uh, Panini Instant. Uh, Euro uh, 2016. Um, it's Portugal kind of winning the tro- uh, the Euro 2016 trophy, um, and it is numbered to 229. So it's an awesome image. Like kind of you know you've got amazing you've got Ronaldo um, kind of lifting aloft this trophy that kind of no no one really expected. I think at the start of the tournament for Portugal to win. Um, definitely not when he went off in the final no definitely. no no exactly exactly um and why have i picked it uh because i was in portugal for the final um so me my then girlfriend now wife um had booked to kind of go to a music festival in lisbon you can look up the dates. They kind of coincided. It was the same weekend. The Sunday was the final, but the, the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I think, were the were the uh, festival dates. So you know, we'd 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 found this really cheap festival on kind of like the continent. It was you uh, looking it was for a bargain. Uh, we 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 were looking for a bargain. So it was kind of you know we weren't going to pay two hundred and forty quid to go to like Clastonbury or whatever. But no. you know, but but the lineup was amazing. It was kind of like so you had. The Pixies, the Chemical Brothers. You had Radiohead. Um, you had Arcade I think Fire. Pearl Jam are headlining this year. Actually, I've deliberated. Are they? Going. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, um, and you know the the other thing is that I mean I don't know if you how, how many how 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 much you go to sort of festivals, but I just you know I can't do tents. So you know the fact that there was basically the city festival taking place just outside Lisbon. You could get public transport there, book an Airbnb. 
it was kind of perfect because it just sort of meant that, you know, you'd have a good night's sleep, <laughs> you'd have a siesta in the afternoon, then you go to a festival, you do a bit of sightseeing in and about. Um, and yeah, so we, we, we used kind of our like British Airways air miles or whatever to fly out there because, uh, tickets were understandably quite expensive. Yes. Um, because you go at the weekend that the festival's on, loads of other people are going to have exactly the same idea. And um, in the end, we were in the air for when Portugal were playing Wales uh, in the semi final. So, you know, there was this sort of tannoy announcement, and the vast majority of the playing were kind of, you know, um, kind of thrilled to hear that Portugal had gone 2 0 up in this game. Um, we never saw any of it because we arrived at in Lisbon at about, I think, midnight that night. Um, but it ultimately meant that we'd be in Portugal for the final. Um, and so we descended on kind of, you know, the main square within um, Lisbon. And I I had went and bought a kind of, was it, it, it was a Portuguese away shirt. You know, one of these, um, I don't know if you remember it. It's kind of from this tournament, it was kind of like the mint green one. Yeah, um, I do remember it. Sort of, I do like, remember it. It's, it's, such a, it's actually such a nice shirt. Um, it's nice. And, it's a nice you know, shirt. It, I'd kind of gone into like the Lisbon Nike store and they'd be like, oh, which player do you want on the back? Do you want Renato Sanchez? Do you want, um, do you want Ronaldo? And I said, uh, can I have Ricardo Carvalho, actually, please? Who is somewhere in, in this picture, but I don't think he played very, very many minutes. Uh, so there I am, like, kind of in the middle of, of the crowd. And I mean, it's a pretty terrible game actually you know i mean um nil nil until either scores in in extra yeah. time and uh you know the, the whole place just sort of erupted and i kind of yeah. you know said to people that it's probably the closest i'll ever be to being in a country when that country wins something because i'm not sure it will ever happen with england um who knows <laughs> that, that final as you say it wasn't the best game um i watched it flat in manchester at the time and uh there, there were so many moths around as well yeah. there, it's like the, the game of the moths that's the thing ronaldo getting them in his mouth and all that stuff yes just... you know yeah there was wasn't there yeah. oh god yeah so, um yeah no uh, so so that that item really i mean i i'd seen it on ebay shortly after i'd kind of like begun collecting cards in the thick of the pandemic and i just thought do you know what i'm trying to buy things that mean something to me i'm not necessarily buying them because they are for their their, their investments or you know they're they're, they're going to be worth something in, in a long time that said empirically you know you're, you're looking at portugal's greatest star lift, lifting aloft probably their greatest accolade at at, at at international level so you know for me it's it, it's a one-of-a-kind piece anyway it, it is significant um, and to be honest with yeah. you i I really like it's weird because obviously my collecting habits tend to be more towards Premier League. So Panini Instance had never really tried to have never really scratched that, but tops now Premier League between 2016 to 2019. I love those years. Um, there are some absolutely fantastic moments just there. I know we always say that tickets are a great portal into the event, which obviously they are. We we like tickets, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> but but the, the tops now, like Rooney, say like Wayne Rooney breaking the Man United goal scoring record against yeah. Stoke, there's a card for that printed to 225, which I yeah. absolutely love those together. Just to pair, even though like the mundane events, are obviously the Euro 2016 wins, not mundane, but I love Panini Instant mm. and I love um, tops now Premier League as well for those three years um so and, yeah you know we we've got a partial example of that coming up um yes we do which, um, on. so we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll um keep that on center hooks for the yeah, moment but... and we, 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 I get, we are going a bit off piste with the next yeah. one we're, we're going away <laughs> yeah. from sport we are um so i'm i'm kind of quite a big fan of kind of animated comedy um, not The Simpsons, funnily enough. Uh, it's probably, again, you know, it goes, harks back to that sort of Asian upbringing. Oh, The, the Simpsons are a bad influence. You know, you're not going right. to watch it. Um, but kind of when, when, when I became kind of 
I suppose, independent enough to choose what I could watch, um, uh, which is probably, you know, early teens. I just, I'd, I'd imagine, you know, the, the things that were really taking off were things like Future Armor, which I loved uh, and still love. Uh, South Park, which I watched because kind of, you know, if you didn't watch it, um, you know, everyone else in school would be like, oh, I can't believe you're not watching it, you know. So true. Um, oh, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I, I'm a few years, I'm a few years younger than you, obviously. So I think I was, I was nine when the whole South Park, Channel 4, 9.30, Friday night craze was there. Yeah. And I, I was allowed to watch it, much for what you say, probably the same reasons. But I I, I like South Park. I re-watched it reasonably recently on quite a few episodes. And there's no way I understood any of those jokes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, even, even at the age of like 12, 13, that I would have been, um, you know, a kind of, it, it, it was those early seasons really of South Park are kind of like scat humor, really. I mean, it's pretty lowbrow stuff. And then it kind of, you know, when, when it hits probably about season five, it, it, it gets, it gets a lot better actually. I think, I think the first sort of four or five seasons or four seasons of South Park are a bit kind of doesn't really know where it's going. Then there's a sort of purple patch sort of between mm. season five and maybe, you know, 12, 13. Um, but yeah, so I've kind of always been a fan of animated comedy in general. So, um, and I think that largely stems from the fact that kind of, you know, an animated comedy uh, make me laugh out loud. You know, situation comedy wouldn't always do that. Um, so, you know, just the just the ways in which, you know, um, something like King of the Hill, for example, you've got, you've got so many laugh out loud moments that arise from this ultra conservative kind of Hank Hill, not understanding his son, Bobby Hill, who's, you know, uh, for all intents and purposes, the complete antithesis of, of, of Hank Hill, you know, he's not, he's not this kind of ex um, American football player. He is, you know, this, fat charming little kid who makes jokes and wants to be a comedian um and i suppose the the funny thing about the training card world is actually if you look for avenues in which you can pick up items that relate to those shows they don't really exist so aside from probably the simpsons and you know you've got those kind of early mid 90s sort of cards you, there's not really anything for south park there's not anything for for future armor there's not anything for king of the hill to my knowledge um and i've always found that quite interesting actually um and so a few years ago i started watching uh bojack horseman on netflix and at first i just didn't get it so I kind of shelved it for a few years and didn't really watch it and then i kind of picked it up again um and especially after like a few friends have said you you'd really like it you just have to kind of stick with it for a bit mm. um and i did they were they were right you know it's exactly what you kind of said earlier it sort of imitates life better than some sitcoms managed to do it um and you know then started to do a bit of kind of research oh has there ever been a card set of this and what popped up was that there there had been this like really strange on demand set with a really low print run and i thought nothing really of it i just um set up a saved search and thought do you know what if that comes up within reason if it's not extortionately priced i'd kind of quite like that because every piece of commentary that i read about bojack horseman is it's one of the greatest kind of comedies of all time so you know if you're thinking 20 30 years sort of down the line you know what will the simpsons be or what will the version of the simpsons be to this generation z um maybe it'll be something like that um and eventually that 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 saved search sort of triggered um and I managed to kind of pick up a complete set of 20 of this on-demand set called, uh, it was called, I think, Tops Bojack Horseman On Demand uh, Horsing Around. And Horsing Around is kind of like this show within a show of, uh, it's a bit like Itchy and Scratchy is yes. kind of in, in uh, you know, um, The Simpsons. So it's this show within a show starring Bojack Horseman as this sort of eponymous sort of, figure within within the um within within the show within a show and so kind of about 18 months ago um 
I submitted all 20 cards to PSA as part of the, one of their like promos and just got the entire set graded. Um, it remains like the only set that has been graded. Um, but I, I just think it's a really cool kind of like um, non-sports sort of card there. So you've got, yeah. um, you know, you've got um, these, these fictional kind of individuals. Uh, <laughs> there's quite a lot of detail on the back for something that didn't have a massive print run. And what I've heard about this set is that it was it was basically um developed as a favor to the producers of the show um and you know they they, they just printed it out and that was it. It, it it it's also a 2017 set so the show ran beyond 2017 um i don't believe there's any other kind of cards related to the show um and yeah so so i mean you know pick this because i'm a big fan of um animated comedy um it's something that's relatively unique within kind of my my collection um and yeah i i figure that actually this is this is something that kind of takes me back to kind of you know watching animated comedy which is something i still do i do it now as kind of like a a way of getting to sleep which um you know is is a terrible habit um but yeah you know in, in yeah, kind of Screen yeah. hygiene, maybe not the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I, you're taking it to a desert island as well, so you need something yeah. maybe a bit different. There. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe this is this is the um, closest I'll get to kind of having something that will help me to get to sleep. I'll have a slab. That's just that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. And and then we're we're. You know, I I knew you're an athletics fan, but I, I, I maybe you didn't know how much of an athletics fan yeah. you were when you were asked to choose all of your items because we're going back to athletics, and again, probably yeah. the, I, the most famous athlete of all time, or one of the most famous athletes of all time. That's that's your next. Yeah, so, Let's chat about um, that. so you saying Bolt? Um, you know, mentioned him briefly, kind of earlier in the um in 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 the show and you know on this night in 2012 been lucky enough to kind of see him win his i think what would end up being his fourth gold medal but at the time was his fifth until the disqualification in the third mm. one that won in beijing um and yeah i mean you know if you have i mean there's never been an athlete in my lifetime that's been quite like him I think, and what I mean by that is kind of, you know, ever since I really started understanding kind of athletics, all all of the focus was on, you know, whether the 100 metre world record would be kind of broken. So you kind of started off with like Linford for me, and then it became Donovan Bailey, and then it was Morris Green, and then it was, you know, is Asso Bolden going to be kind of one of the people that's going to break this record? Um and then kind of out of nowhere, you start hearing about this guy, Usain Bolt. Oh, he's, um, you know, he's, he's, he's crazy quick. And I remember kind of um, the summer of kind of 2008, I was, um, I just graduated from, from, from university. And it, it was in between the period when I had graduated and began my doctorate. And I'd been doing this kind of like youth radio thing for, um every summer for about four or four or five years up until that point so it started off as kind of like this youth enterprise type thing where i was like trying to add something to my ucas statement and it just become something that i'd gotten very attached to and did every summer it was like this temporary license we had it for a month um and you know it was an excuse to play your songs um but in 2008, I'd kind of gotten to the requisite amount of seniority that they entrusted me to look after and coordinate parts of the station. And what that basically meant was that you made, you basically sat in a, a parallel room to the studio uh, and made, made sure that they, there was no swearing on air, basically. That, that, that was it. And, you know, we, we, we took the job kind of not very seriously, to be honest, because I think for me, it was just an excuse to watch the Beijing Olympics, which was taking place during this time, yeah. you know, on this terribly small uh, screen. And so for the month of August, we were basically glued to what was going on in Beijing. And, you know, just 
like the build up to the 100 meters i think even at that point i hadn't even seen him run before but you know what the 100 meters is like you kind of have the heats on 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 day one kind of within the athletic stadium which is kind of week two usually and then on day two you have the semi-final and the final um and you know he'd he'd obviously sauntered to victory in basically all of those heats up until that point and then you kind of like you're all there at probably what was about one or two o'clock in the afternoon watching this race and man that the distance by which kind of he won that 100 meters is and you know the fact that he was showboating kind of halfway down it's just the most astonishing thing i've ever seen in my life like kind yeah. of and 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 you know this is this is this is a guy that basically shattered the world record from a position of you know he basically gave up after like 80 meters, you know, he was just like showboating from that point on. Um, and, you know, th- this is a record that had been incrementally sort of like going down by hundredths of a second up until that point, you know, um, through all of the kind of aforementioned athletes, whether it was kind of, you know, Carl Lewis or Donovan Bailey or Morris Green or who- whoever it had been. It, I mean, you know, Bolt just came in and just absolutely obliterated this record. Um, and then he did it again in the 200 meters. Then he did it again the following year, kind of, you know, at, um, at uh, um, Berlin for, 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 the, for the world. He, you know, he set the 100 and 200 meter record there, uh, both of which still stand. Um, quite simply, I, I think, you know, I said this on a, on a different podcast before, but I think he's the greatest thing to happen to athletics because, it was just so far ahead of the field, but it's also the worst thing because, like, the field just could not keep up. And you know, even even an athlete who's as dominant as, say, Noah Lyles is just, to to my mind, he's just he's nowhere near what Usain Bolt was, and that's quite amazing given how how close like the hundred meters was for such a long period of time. He's so, a- yeah, I suppose for me, he's become that athlete that I am slightly obsessed with i would say <laughs> unhealthily obsessed with um and i've just tried to pick up every ticket of note of his over time whether that's um you know from from his olympics debut through to kind of his very last races but a few years ago a ticket popped up on the discord that um we we both belong to the ticket discord um and it was a signed ticket um from Usain Bolt, uh, on his Central Coast Mariners debut. So if you've ever followed Usain Bolt's career, he's he's never, um, you know, shied away from his passion for football. Um, and for me, the moment I saw that, I was like, I need to have that ticket. Uh, there's, there's, there was just a compulsion. Like, I, I, I needed to have that ticket. Um, and so I offered, it, uh, offered up kind of a spare professional debut for Cristiano Ronaldo that I had in my collection as a direct exchange for it. The guy happily obliged. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is it. I mean, it's just for me, brilliant. This, this is just an incredible ticket. I mean, this is the greatest athlete I think I've ever, ever had the, uh, like that, that's ever, ever like in my lifetime that, that has existed. I think, you know, I don't know. I might have said that about Rudisha. <laughs> yeah, but, but Bolt, Bolt you, is, <laughs> yeah, I'm so fickle. You're charitable with your affections. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, this, this ticket, I, I suppose it's a bit like, you know, Michael Jordan playing baseball and, you know, mm. do, do it, or Peter Cech becoming like an ice hockey kind of player at sort of, you know, uh, like in, in 2023, it, it's it's strange because um, it, it's almost something that you kind of you kind of have to kind of be like, did that really happen? And uh, yes, it did really happen. And he was offered a contract by the Central Coast Mariners, which he never took up. And there is an object that ha- that that happens to be from that day that he fulfilled a lifelong dream of becoming a soccer player, and he signed the ticket. And for me, you know, I've got all of the normal tickets that you would want associated with the Usain Bolt. I've got all of his world records, got, got the debuts, got all of the golds, got his last races, but that is the one that I think is like the cherry on top of that, that collection. Um, and for me, it's just, yeah, it's, it's an awesome piece. I just love it. 
I I completely agree. And it's almost like, you know, you see quite a few things like, oh, what to collect, how to collect yeah. and all these things, which I don't I don't really enjoy, to be honest with you. And I, I think but for instance, that the way I approach collecting, if you identify a subject piece, is you you know, you have your and I'm not gonna assign relative preference to them, but you have the pro you know the the pro debuts and stuff or the first appearances the last appearances milestone moments then you know the the big moments that that particular person has and then you have those like i guess this is a big one but you have those like quirky bits as well that add a bit of you know body to it like say like beckham you know you've got you know day of the flying boot and things like that which is or or the metatarsal injury which just add that little bit onto those sorts of more um bigger moments and things and i think that's how you build up a body of a collection and with bolt you've clearly done that you've got the gold medal run you've got his olympics debut and his football career is is quite interesting <laughs> i don't know how much you know about it we won't speak about it but there's a <laughs> it's an interesting career and his central coast i think he was he was offered 150,000 net per year but he wanted 3 million or some, something like that and they were like we cannot we cannot afford that as an A-League he, club. Yeah, I think I think you know it's it's one of those where I th- I think you know it's it's a bit like was it Dwayne Chambers wanted to be, like became like an American football player or yeah. you know you hear about the odd sprinter that becomes a bobsleigh uh, and it's like kind of they're kind of, they're not that similar actually but I mean, it's it's exactly as you say. It's that sort of slight left field choice, but it's one that I think enhances the rest of the bulk collection that I have. And you know, it, it, if if you had to push me to keep one of everything that I have, it wouldn't be the run of the mill things that I have for bulk. It would be the one thing that is really unique in that collection. And that assigned ticket from from his football debut is, yeah, as unique as they come. It's like I love I love things together as sets. There's so much of what I, I try to target is things as like invincibles, things like this. But that you know, it's ultimately it's those things like you say, like the non reproducible things, the things that you cannot get back. So Olympics Day, yeah. oh, that's a that's a cool yeah. ticket, but yeah. you can get it back. You, you can, yeah, you yeah, can yeah, exactly. Get it back. Yeah. Um, whereas you know, Central Coast Mariners debut signed by him. There are so many barriers to one. The ticket is pretty obscure yeah. i imagine and then it's signed but it's crazy um, <laughs> yeah but i was happy i was very happy you included it i i, I thought you <laughs> i thought you probably would include it to be honest um, yeah I think, I think for me it's it's you know i wouldn't say that it's it's perhaps on, uh, on on the cultural impact level of say something like the black power salute that we had earlier I mean, nowhere near, but at the same time, in, in, in terms of athletes that have been resonant with me um, over the course of my lifetime, Usain Bolt is, for me, head and shoulders above any other kind of pure athlete. And, you know, it has everything, you know, the flair, the charisma, the, the, the talent, the, the, you know, the record actually to go with it. And, um, you know, it's, yeah, uh, I'm just such a fanboy. It's really um, that I could not pick a pick an item of of relevance, um, and that's that's what I've opted for. Um, yeah, he is a very unique individual, <laughs> and another unique individual. <laughs> unique your individual. daughter. So yeah, let's so, let's have yeah. a chat about your next item. Yeah. So, um, I suppose. It's it's probably worth kind of just 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 talking through um, becoming a father, I suppose, for the first time. And I think I was probably like most men, not very ready for it. Um, and you know, my my wife became pregnant in kind of autumn of twenty eighteen, uh, and in the first sort of 20 weeks we kind of hadn't really to be honest um i was i was just enjoying not having a kid i was just playing like fifa all the time on 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 the playstation i was i was just like this is going to be my last winter where i can get away with doing this and you know at our 
sort of 20 week scan, which is kind of the time in the UK where you sort of discover the sex of your child. Um, we opted to find out. We found out that it was a daughter. Um, and we were then told that um, they just needed to run a few extra checks. Uh, so could we come back in like 10, 15 minutes or whatever when we're, when we're doing this ultrasound scan? And, um, you know, there, there was this brief period of kind of like, oh, I'm so happy that I'm having a, having a daughter. Because I really wanted a daughter, actually. Like, no, not, not to piss on, piss on my no, son, I... who's lovely as well. Did, did say earlier Please. about how he, he could do with being a better sleeper, but you know, I, I mean, I'm... a lot <laughs> of baby of boys and girls, and um, let's just say girls are better. <laughs> yeah, I can I can attest to that from being a parent of one of each now. Um, no, I love them both. Uh, <laughs> I feel the need to say that, but but you know, we <laughs> we we, we, we um, very much kind of you know, I was, I, I was thrilled like that it was. It was, it was a daughter. We got asked to come back in kind of after, and during this time I'd kind of like, you know, texted my sister and said, it's a girl. Um, and they performed the rest of the ultrasound scan. And at that point they, they kind of came clean and said that, look, we're seeing something that we don't expect to see on this scan. Mm. And uh, it, hit, it hit us both like a ton of bricks actually. Um, and you know basically what they what they'd seen was that i think the heart was on the same side as the stomach and often i think if you take a lateral view it should be on the other side or something funny yes. like that um and so we were referred to kind of fetal medicine and this was kind of you know a few days before christmas um and they uh ushered us back in the following day they said you know we we need to carry out for further tests had to undergo this procedure called like an amniocentesis, which you're probably very familiar with, but it basically involves kind of, you know, um, extracting a bit of amniotic fluid. It's, you know, highly traumatic kind of procedure for my wife to kind of have gone through. And there is a, there is a chance of course of fetal loss with it. It's Ex- not exactly, you know, it's, so... it's not, it's not a, you know, and we were basically told, you know, there is a chance that this would result in in a miscarriage. Um, I think at the time we were, you know, we were just struggling to kind of take in all of the information. And, you know, from that sort of 20 week scan onwards for the next, I think, five months of the pregnancy, we were in and out of, um, you know, hospitals. So Adam Brooks in Cambridge and um and Great Ormond Street in London as well, you know, just for checkups on how the development of the heart was going through to, you know, what we would be faced with um, when when our daughter would be born. And and actually, you know, you know, from from big questions as well, you know, did we did we want to terminate this pregnancy through mm-hmm. to, you know, things like, oh, uh, you know, your 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 daughter will probably have a laterality disorder, which means that, you know, she might have kind of you know her heart on the wrong side um uh she may uh, not have a spleen which is exactly what she does have actually she doesn't have a spleen which means that she takes penicillin kind of yes. twice daily and, and has done kind of you know for, for for pretty much all of her life and probably will do um and you know i think i think this all kind of with the benefit of hindsight took its toll (laughs) i think on us we didn't quite realize quite how affected by it we all were and it would probably become apparent many months later when you know i was feeling burnt out at work and needed to take some time off uh Mm. to to cope with becoming a father and all of this sort of trauma that we had to sort of unpick um and you know the the birth itself was kind of you know an emergency uh, c section not what we had sort of planned um and we were in kind of postnatal ward for a number of kind of days afterwards um this is i mean it seems kind of like abstract but one of the things that was sort of keeping me sane during these times was was kind of you know playing computer games because it was it was it was escapism for me it was it was you know it it I have a habit of kind of burying my head into um, other activities when something big or traumatic is happening. And so I suppose we, you know, just got really into kind of playing computer games again. And and I suppose 
you know, also watching the football. And, you know, the football was actually um, quite compelling watching that season. Um, so you had this title race where Man City and Liverpool went all the way to the wire, basically. I think that was probably the season, I think, that Liverpool finished second, but ended up winning the Champions League, if I remember correctly. I might it be was. wrong. It was that season, In wasn't it? In the worst final of all time, but the, the <laughs> yeah, title was race was very exciting. Sorry, In fact, funny, one of the funny things is that I remember my daughter was actually only a few days old when Spurs, I think, overturned the 2-0 two, two um, deficit that they were at in, in Ajax. And, yeah. you know, it, was, it, it was kind of an, an insane sort of achievement to turn that around. But um, this particular event had been scheduled for the day that my daughter was born, the 4th of May, or May the 4th, you know, so Star Wars Day. And we continue to get all of the quips like, you know, is your daughter's name Leia? To which I always respond to the lines of, no, no, we actually called her Jar Jar or C-3PO, um, <laughs> which I find humorous, but, you know, maybe that's... Funny. Still... I, I laughed, I laughed. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that's the level of dad joke that I'm getting to. <laughs> now. Um, so this, this game eventually would be rescheduled to take place two days after. Um, and, but, but the ticket that I have actually still has my daughter's, um, my daughter's birthday on it. So if you can see there, it says 04, yes. 04, 2019. That's the exact day that she was born. It was rescheduled for the 6th of May. And this is the game in which basically it was, it was Vincent company's last home game. Uh, and he scores this absolute screamer basically uh, from, you know, a good 30 yards out. It ends up being voted goal of the season and it all, but really seals the title for uh, Man City. Um, for incredible. me, uh, yeah, incredible goal. Um, from an incredible player for for for, for Man City, really, um, an unlikely source as well. Yeah. You know. And you know, a game that was basically gridlocked at that point. And you know, I was watching on on my phone in the postnatal ward. You know, even even I kind of had this moment of thinking it's all going to be okay. <laughs> um, you know, watching it and thinking, you know, life is continuing around us. Um. I've gone on and kind of, you know, ended up getting, uh, not a lot of people kind of know this, but um, there's, uh, you know, we mentioned earlier, there's a, there's a kind of tops now Premier League set, but there's, there's a card that actually goes along with, with the ticket. Now this one actually has the corrected date of 6th of May on it, mm. uh, just there, as does the program also 6th of May, but yeah, that's a little set that I've kind of got, um, which just, sort of reminds me of that time, you know, difficult time really um, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but it's also, you know, it's my daughter's birthday and it's on the ticket. And, you know, I, I, like Vincent Company is one of these people that actually does a few signings and I have mulled over whether I kind of crack it open to get it signed, but I'm not sure I actually would to tell you the truth. I think- I'd I think get it signed by your daughter. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that's, that. That's the person to get it signed by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably what I should do. Um, yeah, it's it takes me back to a time in my life that was actually pretty difficult, but also kind of you know reminds me that sort of you know life's going on around you. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it was a difficult time. Um, strange to sort of pick something that reminds you of a difficult time in your life, but um, yeah, it, it, it absolutely had to be picked. It's kind of one of those that you know. I was like, if I'm going to pick a few tickets for this show um, that I would take to Desert Island, I would absolutely take this one with me. Um, and yeah, you know, um, that's exactly why it's picked. Um, yeah, for me, this was this was the the one that I, I knew you'd pick, and um, yeah. <laughs> it's also the one I was looking forward to. Yeah. Probably too many rom coms in my formative years, <laughs> and it, you know, too much smaltzy stuff. It was the one I was looking forward to talking about the most because it's incredible. And the mm. fact that you have, you know, you probably have an affinity maybe for Vincent Company, or, you know, maybe because of that as well. And it shows you yeah. these sorts of parasocial almost relationships can develop from these moments and how we use them as an anchor. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I, I would say, you know, my wife and m m much of her family are, are Manchester City supporters. Um, and I think by proxy, they've probably become the um, Premier League team that I most closely follow. Um, that that kind of, I suppose, 
abstractly will segue into the the final item because yes. you know, um i don't know if we should maybe we should just go straight into it i i guess i you think know, i think it's a yeah. it's the, the grand finale yeah uh, <laughs> a, a real power piece <laughs> <laughs> and um let's see what it, let's see what it yeah is. so look it's it's this item here um which is um jordan ibe um it's a one of one um it's from the inaugural uh panini prism set um on the back here you might not be able to read but i'll read it out to you it says at the age of 15 ibe made his first senior appearance when he suited up for wickham wanderers that got the attention of plenty of big club names and led to his signing with Liverpool, where he made his Premier League debut. Now 23, um, Ibe continues to turn heads with his play on the wing with Bournemouth. Um, so I grew up in Wickham, um, High Wickham, um, which is kind of where um, Jordan and I rose to prominence, I suppose, you know, as this young 15-year-old player yes. playing alongside the likes of player manager, I think, or the person who would go on to be player manager, Gareth Ainsworth. Um, so, you know, really young kid, um, became Wickham's all-time kind of youngest player, but also all-time youngest goal scorer. Uh, and both are records, I believe, which still stand. Um, and it sort of coincided with a time where I was getting increasingly sort of disillusioned with top flight football. I think that's the case because I think there was probably post, I, I think I'd probably been like a Chelsea follower up until about 2013, 2014. And I think there was this kind of feeling for me that players weren't really playing for the shirt anymore. Mm. They were sort of beginning to play for kind of, you know, money really. and. To be honest, it just began to wear down on me a little bit. Like I was kind of, you know, just getting more and more annoyed with the petulance of it all. And at at that time, Wickham were going through an incredibly difficult time in the league. So they almost dropped out of the league altogether. Um, And they stayed up on the final day of the season, I think in the 14-15 season, um, through... um, Basically, I think Bristol Rovers managing to lose to an appoint- opponent sent them down rather than Wickham. And they'd only, I think, been out of the relegation zone uh, on that final day. Um, and around that sort of time, it was it was strange. I was beginning to follow Wickham a lot closer than I had ever done so as a child. Um, you know, I mean, I'd always been aware of Wickham Wanderers. It would be hard not to if you were in a town where you'd sort of grown up, the, the hometown, like, kind of had a had a team that was in the football league um were they a big deal uh, are they a big deal in Wickham do they do is it like a big well, thing? the thing about Wickham is that it's predominantly a rugby town um and it's always been that way you know it, it's got a lot of um grammar schools that basically would would not play f- like you know the grammar school that I went to didn't have a football team because it was you know not a men's game sort of thing you know rugby was mm. and you know it's no uh, coincidence that you had the likes of so Matt Dawson went to the same school that I did um but you had lots of kind of um players that um lived around bucks and eventually uh Wickham Wanderers would have a ground share with London Wasps when they moved out of London uh, and before they moved to the Rico Arena. Um, and the funny thing about that is that, you know, you'd have games that would alternate weekends. So, you know, there'd be Wickham on a Saturday, the following Sunday, Wasps would be playing at home, and Wasps would always sell out. Mm. Wickham, on the other hand, you'd be lucky if you were half full. Um, and even to this day, they they don't sell out. Um, you know, it's out of town, but Wick- Wickham's always been like a rugby town. It's a really strange kind of, uh, mix um, of things um, and yeah I suppose in, in around 2014-15 I began to follow them a little bit more closely um, and you had this kind of strange guy with kind of flowing locks Gareth Ainsworth becoming manager um, and it was kind of fan owned at the time so Wickham had um, been owned by the same guy that owned London Wasps who didn't actually want Wickham at all um, so uh well, in I the end one free. <laughs> exactly in the end um no one was willing to put forward an offer so the supporters built a trust and uh um got wickham um 
and basically i mean they had to make loads of really tough decisions like culling the youth academy because it was too expensive to run mm. um and you know it, it was it, it was basically on the cusp of, of bankruptcy um until <laughs> jordan and i moved to bournemouth um and the reason is that you know wickham had i don't know had been advised or cleverly had uh inserted a sell on clause of i think is it 25 percent that basically meant that wickham had a windfall of nearly four million pounds which yeah. for a kind of league one league two club is just insane um and you know basically kept them kept them afloat um and yeah i suppose you know on from that you you know it's it, 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 Wickham just got a really interesting club to follow. You had the big sort of personality of Adebayo Akinfenwa, um, you know, at the end of his of time course. at AFC Wimbledon joining. Um, but you also had these, you had incredible players in the lower leagues. You know, you had Ebere Eze, who, um, who was on loan. But, you you know, you, you had loads of players who would, who would go and play at higher levels eventually. Um, starting off at Wickham, you had players like Alfie Mawson, who became a kind of nearly an English in England international. Yes. Yes, I think uh, Mawson's retired. Even I, he, yeah, he, he came got, back to he, he came back to Wickham. I think a couple of seasons yeah. ago, maybe even last season, and you know, then then said, "My body can't do this anymore." And it, it was really sad. Um, you know, what one of the sad things about Jordan I is that his career has kind of gone to shit, basically. You know, he, he wouldn't even get into the Wickham team now, which is just such a This is sad... your first language warning for Desert <laughs> Island Slavs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's such a sad tale of kind of like, you know, I mean, you read the back of this card and you think this guy's going places and obviously the place where he's going is... It's the cafe that he crashed his Rolls Royce into in, yeah, and in, near London, and you know, I think spiral of depression it, as well. Bless him. Exactly, and you know, I think he's sort of bounced between sort of like after leaving Bournemouth, went to Derby, played like a few minutes of the game there, then was released, and that's when he made his sort of big statement on mental health. Uh, moved to Turkey for a bit. I don't think that worked out for him. And now I think he's in the lower leagues. I think he was at Ebbsfleet, I want to say. Yeah, he's um, playing for Ebbsfleet now. Um, and I'm I'm not even sure he's kind of, you know, making appearances there. So, I, I mean, it's a really sad tale, actually. Um, but in terms of kind of, you know, it just sort of reminds me of Wickham, really, the card. It's, it's, it's almost a bit of a meme card because it's like, you know, the moment I spent money on this, like no one's ever going to actually want to buy that off me. But for me, it still represents kind of a team that's incredibly fun, that I'm incredibly fond of and is close to my heart. Um, and, you know, speaks volumes about the fact that I think, you know, it's a shame that we don't have more cards of, 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 of clubs that we kind of follow, like in the lower leagues. I think, you know, a club like, Wickham Wanderers have actually had a hell of a lot of players go through it that have never had a card and will never probably have a card. So, you know, someone like Adebayo Akinfenwa never had a card. Kind of can't yeah, do anything about that. It's um, um, very sad that Akinfenwa doesn't have a card uh, as yeah. an example. And there are, there are probably quite a few players. I know I've heard of suggestions about a Bowman type thing and things. I, I mean, licensing, I think, will be difficult, but I, I don't know. It's a... Yeah, you kind of you kind of wonder whether um, you know it's an appetite thing, but I think um, slightly you know the, the the proxy for me has become you know if it's if it's a player that started off at Wickham or played at some point at Wickham, I, I tend to try and pick up a few of their cards. So you know you end up with strange things like you know I'm looking out for a short print Sam Vokes card because he plays there and. I mean, you know, Sammy the market Vokes. for that is just like non-existent, you know. But they, it turns out that he's in the Euro 2020 select set. So, you know, there's there's the odd gold prism out there and you're like, can I really justify spending 60 quid on this? It's like, probably not. But, um, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, the Jordan I've cost a little bit more than that. Um, you know, um, I'm not sure I'll ever get that back. But, yeah, it's it's a desert island um, slab for me. And yeah. the, the card is from 2019. Premier League prism is that that correct? That's right. Um, unfortunately, um, the the labelling 
uh, has this as the breakaway prism. It's not. It's the. I was about to say because I can see that, but it doesn't. I was about to say it doesn't look like a breakaway. It's not. But yeah. Um, so I'm three cards off of having the complete rainbow, which isn't something that I really would bother doing for many players. So I need the um, the gold power. And then I need the breakaway black, which, you know, if you look at the PSA pop report, it's already been graded, only it hasn't. Um, and I think I need like a green breakaway or something funny out of 10. Um, I don't know if I'll ever complete it, but I have a few saved searches set up and, you know, if it pops up, I'll, I'll snipe it. Yeah, and it's, uh, to be honest, I, I quite like, I'm trying to think of if I own any, I do own some, I've, I've got some, Vard, I basically wanted to collect all like Vardy colour match blue cards from the Premier League year. So I've obviously got 2019 Prism as, as part of that. And I like it. It's a, yeah. I actually quite like the slightly more zoomed out look to that set. Yeah, I, 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 I like this set. I think it's, um, I, what, one of the things I will say about like a lot of cards that I, collect more generally in in my collection is the, the ones that have like a solid frame around the outside tend to be visually like nicer to look at and um the design of kind of like prism premier league over the years has not always had a defined border around the outside so tops museum which is something that i've collected for a number of years now um 2019 20 and 2020 21 both have a frame around the outside the most recent one doesn't and i like it a lot less mm. um so yeah i don't know i think it's it, it's similar with a lot of other things that i can think of, of off the top of my head you know bundesliga chrome the one with kind of jude bellingham's rookie i i think that's a really nice looking card again a thick border around the outside uh, it, yeah it's kind of it is it is a really really nice set i think yeah, it's a, it's a 2019 pr- Premier League Prism is a good set, and then I mean, I, I think they. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bash Premier League Prism. It just <laughs> it's not a set I tend to, to uh, put on my calendar every year when it comes out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, um, me. Either. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and so that's a uh, that's all the items we've spoken about. All eight items we've spoken about, and yeah, it's such a diverse range that we've discussed yeah. and I like to think that kind of people would be um not not necessarily surprised by the choices that are made. I think on face value if you tell them if you tell people, oh, you're selecting a Jordan Ibe one of one and a random ticket from a Man City game, they wouldn't necessarily understand it. So hopefully the stories around kind of why the selections have been made have kind of added a little bit of colour to why these items are important to me. And that's, that. to be honest, that's exactly, I think I, when did I speak to you about Desert Island Slabs? About nearly two years ago now, probably. Yeah. And it, it, this is exactly why I wanted to do this because we we hear a lot of you know we see a lot of very similar cards and they're they're yeah. amazing and this isn't me talking bad about them i i love seeing the really lovely gold parallels they look beautiful and amazing iconic tickets like black the equivalent of black power i i love seeing yeah. those tickets it's incredible but for me the being it's actually the individual and and yeah. each time i'd like to see the individual's choices and if they want to choose you know the seven equivalents of black powers that's great that's 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 part that's is their episode it's their choice but for me see, hearing the company story hearing the lisbon stories as well is incredible mm. and yeah. yeah you know it's deeply personal all of these choices and kind of you know hopefully as you do more of these you, you you'll hear more and more interesting stories it's kind of you know it, I, don't, I don't want to be like sniffy about it but actually i mean i could have i could have chosen you know or i can imagine someone choosing you know uh eight 2014 gold prisms and it's like doesn't do anything for me these these items that i've kind of presented they all do something for me and that's kind of you know hopefully the essence of what others will pick too yeah and um yeah are there any other things that words you want to say or anything before we uh, no just just uh you know uh, i i feel like i've done loads of talking uh so i feel like you know um hopefully 
hopefully it's not been a chore for people to listen to um that's all <laughs> no yeah I, I i was definitely incredibly entertained and the way you told the stories like i've already said incredible <laughs> thank you so much for coming on and being the first guest it's a pleasure an honor a pleasure for me as well cheers james right. thank you very much fab thanks <laughs>